Okay, we are recording. Vince, how are you today? I'm great, thank you. Really good to uh, to be here. Oh, wonderful, mate. Well, I'm looking forward to chatting records with you. Um, yeah. Well, look, let's, let's just jump straight in and let's kick things off with the song that you regard as having the greatest ever intro, please. Right, okay. Um, there are literally thousands. And for me, introductions, kind of the most important thing, because, you know, if you lose an audience... So if you lose an audience there, then you haven't got an audience. Um, I'm a huge fan of Billy Joel. Um, and uh, I remember hearing New York State of Mind um, on the old Grey Whistle Test, if you ever, a video on uh, on YouTube. And the introduction to that, it's about a minute long. Mm. But I don't know, there's something about it that just, um, I don't know whether it's the, the title or the intro, or a mix of the, the two, but it just transports me to a, a fictional life that I never had in New York. <laughs> I, I, I'm interested in what you said there. Like, you know, you were saying about how many, you know, songs there are that you could have chose from and, and, and you know, you've got to get them with that intro. And then you give us this Billy Joel song, which has got a, <laughs> a minute before we get a vocal. Yeah. And I think in 2024, if you rock up to the label and go, I've got this great song, there's no vocal for a minute. I think they're going to be, well, hang on a minute. What, what, what's going on here? Like, this I don't even get to the door. <laughs> exactly. And so with that kind of pressure to hook people instantly and get your music on these Spotify playlists and, and, and you know, and, and to try and hook people on TikTok and all of these kind of trends, yeah. Does it, how much of that filters into your creative process? Uh, yeah, okay. So I feel like one of the reasons why it's taken so long for me to make a to make a record that's, you know, coming out shortly is that I did feel like, you know, uh, there was a lot of compromise involved in in, you know, creating something that, you know, that I truly love. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it does. It, you know, I think the short answer is it does factor in. Yeah, you, you you have to. I mean, I I listen to every single kind of music you can think of. Everything everything from um, show tunes <laughs> to to um, you know hardcore dance. You know everything from Queens of the Stone Age to Nora Jones. Yeah. Um, what I like to do is try and differentiate between what is great. And, you know, and what is just, you know, I, I guess for pardon, you know, for want of a better word, filler, yeah. you know, and I think that for me, it, it doesn't really matter about the genre. Yeah. So if it hits you in the face straight away, then I was listening to the Idols, you know, the, 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 the Idols band the other day. Yeah. It's about as far away from my style of music as possible. Yeah. I heard this one song and I was like, you know, I won't swear, but like I was you like, you can swear, mate, because they're a fucking the great band. band. Like, <laughs> you know, and and it was kind of like it was exciting, and it made me, you know, made me want to, you know, engage with that music. It, it it didn't necessarily, you know, it didn't necessarily do anything for me melodically, but what yeah. they were saying and the energy that that they were given that that's that was it for me. So I guess, yeah. you know, I'm I'm aware of the fact that you know, in commercial music. If I was to, you know, if I wanted to commit career suicide, I'd do a, you know, one minute long intro and make that the radio edit for a single. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Um, but you know, the, the I, th I think you know, I just I like to try and make music that 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 connects with me and hopefully therefore connects with other people. Absolutely, absolutely. Tell me about the first song that had an emotional impact on you, please, Vince. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean. That's kind of a no-brainer for me. Uh, it was Goo Goo Dolls, Iris. Um, and I literally remember, I remember hearing it and I remember going out and buying it. I can't remember whether, actually, I, I'll tell a lie. I don't know whether I bought it. I think I may have, have got it off Napster. <laughs> and, um, which, <laughs> so, um, but I remember immediately wanting to have it in my life. And I remember being at a university in my first year, um, having a pretty hard time of it, to be honest with you. I, I was, I guess I was, I, I was doing sports science. I, you know, I felt like I was supposed to be, 
you know, a, you know, a sportsman. And actually, you know, with hindsight, there was this massive part of me that, you know, that, you know, needed to create and, you know, and be an artist and be a musician. And I, I literally remember being in my room, just, just, you know, when you kind of like dance with no abandon, you know, like Phoebe, like Phoebe running in yeah, friend, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I remember being in my room just on my own, literally just hands out and just spinning, like spinning round and round in circles and just, <laughs> Yeah, I, and that was the first song I ever remember listening to that that really just made me just kind of go, yes, everything's all right. Yeah. Did, did you feel, you know, I'm, I'm, I've had lots of guests on this this show that have that have, have kind of echoed what you said there that 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 went to university and and you know had had ambitions to be you know a footballer uh, and but music was always next to it. And, yeah. and I just wonder, in 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 a world of of, of football and and you know, there, there's lots of kind of alpha males in in that environment. And I'm generalising a little here, Vince. But did you feel, you know, when when you start connecting with songs like Iris, you know, yeah. did you feel that you were surrounded by people where you could show that vulnerability and show that no. emotional, <laughs> you know, side Absolutely of what you? Yeah. Not. I mean, I I grew up in Plymouth where it just was not cool to do anything to do with the arts. Yeah. You know, if if I even I remember being asked if I would join the school choir because the music teacher had heard me singing in a corridor. And I remember, you know, thinking about it for about one second flat and, <laughs> and imagining how many times I was going to get beaten up in the playground because yeah, I was yeah. totally you know, I was suddenly um, singing in a choir. Um, so, and to be honest with you, it wasn't even that music was was side by side. Sure. Um, I got a guitar almost by accident um, on, you know, on my 21st Christmas. I went home um, from university and my mum was working at Beckton and Dickinson's, at, you know, doing night shifts, you know, with putting syringes together. And one of her friends said, does anybody want this guitar? And she was giving it away for like a fiver. And, it, you know, Christmas Day it arrived in a bin liner because mum didn't have any, <laughs> any any wrapping paper and it was broken, bust up. I never knew how much I needed a guitar until I was given it. Wow. You know, so like, yeah, it wasn't even, it was really was one of those moments where like, I didn't know what was missing i knew something was missing yeah i was very frustrated um i kind of you know i got on with everybody but you know it, it, like one of the lyrics of the you know uh, one of the songs on my album is basically um you know it's basically about my only way to you know to not be bullied was to fit in i kind of became a chameleon when i was younger yeah, yeah, i, I yeah. think a lot of people do <clears throat> absolutely you know, the whole Absolutely. idea of wanting to fit in, wanting to belong. But I I didn't realise the reason why I didn't fit in or belong was because I was, you know, I was missing this really important part of my life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think school's a, a very difficult thing to sort of navigate your way through at the best yeah. of times. And, uh, but, to, you know, the, the, the thing is as well, but I mean, we'll get on to school in a moment, but so many people reach adulthood and still you know, don't find the time or the, or, 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 or even know what it is that's missing. And, and to be able to find, you know, to have someone gift you a guitar and, and that, that piece of the puzzle suddenly fits. That's, that's oh, joyous, I'm, man. Like, I'm what, lucky. What, what a moment. Yeah. I, I'm very lucky. You know, I mean, some of the most interesting people, like, you know, paraphrasing sunscreen, you know, that yeah. song from the you know, early 2000s, you know, some of the most interesting people I know still don't know who they want to be. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And they're, you know, and they're in their fifties or sixties, and but I'm, I'm very, you know, I, I was blessed, really, you know, and I didn't realize it at the time. I was young, dumb, and full of, you know, <laughs> and all I wanted, you know, I, I also realized very quickly that, you know, having a guitar and being able to sing was was very popular with the opposite sex. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so uh, as much I think, you know. Deep down, you know, I could feel it in my heart. That was, you know, that was the, th that, you know, it was definitely something that, 
resonated with me and just I was like I need this I need uh, this is what I'm meant to be doing and the other side of it was like th this is a great ride <laughs> yeah 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 absolutely you know? absolutely so, uh, yeah well look we've touched on school so let's let's um let's find a track that uh that reminds you of your time at school please Vince yeah um that's that's a funny one because uh, I, I don't think this guy was even alive when I was at school but yeah. um I heard it uh, maybe two and a half years ago. I think Sam Fender's a huge talent. Mm. And um, hypersonic missiles, it's just got all that arrogance and naivety of youth, um, you know, but it's also the acceptance that, you know, there's, there's a line in it where, you know, talking about wars and stuff and basically, you know, just being dumb enough to really not know what it's, you know, what's going on and, yeah. or what, uh, and you can't really fix it sort of thing. But... I think musically, this is another song that kind of really affected me when I heard it. The first verse, I was like, who's this guy? Because I'd never heard him before, before yeah. hearing the song. I was like, kind of sounds like the guy from The Killers. Sounds like Brandon Flowers. Sounds like Kings of Leon, et cetera, et cetera. And then this glorious chorus that does, I, it, you know, in my opinion, it just makes you nostalgic, makes you want to put your hands out, you know, to you know to either side and spin around and look up at the sun yeah you know, and that kind of reminds me of you know hazy summers you know riding bmx bikes and you know my dad having a yellow ford cortina <laughs> <laughs> um i mean that's outside of school so getting back into school was was that a time of your life that you enjoyed mm. um oh what a life I guess kind of all, all the all the highs and lows. I mean, I can't I can't honestly say that I ever really felt like I fit in at school. Mm -hmm. I felt, you know, I mean, you know, to to give you an idea, for for two years instead of having a, a lunch break, I became a library prefect, partly because I fancied the um the girl that was the also a library prefect, but mainly because I just didn't feel like I had much in common with, you know, I had enough in common with the lads to play, you know, to play all the different sports with them, but I didn't really have enough in common with them to, you know, to, you know, talk about the world with and, yeah. you know, and yeah. So I, I loved my childhood. Um, I think I probably enjoyed my childhood outside of school more than I did my my childhood in school but I don't I don't think it'd be fair to say that I didn't enjoy school um you know I think like most people um you look back at your childhood with kind of rose tinted glasses and you know everything was jumpers for goalposts yeah of course you know um if I if I really think about it probably you know it wasn't like that you know yeah probably every other day would be a you know would be a bad day yeah. But, but on balance, you know, I had a, I had an amazing childhood. I grew up by the sea, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, and, you know, it was in the, you know, it was back in the day where, you know, your parents would kick you out in the summer and go, don't come home to the streetlights, come on. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. Um, that kind of freedom, you know, maybe isn't, a, you know, isn't so much around these days, especially being a parent myself, you know, so I don't yeah, think so. I, had a great time. I always find it quite quite nice. Uh, you know, if I'm driving home from from, you know, wherever and all of a sudden over the park you see you see some lads playing football. It's like you don't see that very often anymore. And it's like no, you but um, you know, it again with the rose tinted glasses, you know, I look back and just think, well, every day that's all we do for like fifteen hours a day, you know, just one glass of squash at lunchtime, that's all we needed. And like and I'm sure the realities of it weren't quite quite that. But um I, I think obviously without sounding like an old bastard, you know, we do live in a world now where, you know, I've got two, I say children, I've got a, a 19 year old and a, and a 21 year old and, and, you know, the telephones, you know, in their hands has become such an integral part of their life, uh, which is, you know, which is a real shame. And, and, you know, I had, well, for the best part of my life, I had three channels of television before I got four, and uh, and and now they got a million, and uh, and then, you know, and, it, and, 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 and it's really weird because I, I I run a nightclub, 
And uh, and what we've seen, it, real big changes over the years is because so much stuff is now on their phone. So if you want to meet someone from the opposite sex, you're on an app on your phone. If you want to hear music that, you know, you might not hear in the club or you'd go to a club early and, and pester the DJ to play this new record because you have you can't get it anywhere. It's not out yet. Everything's on Spotify. So you've basically got every single thing you need for a night out. You want to order some food? Get, pick your phone up. Someone will deliver it to you. Someone will deliver your booze. You know, it's like, it's all there. And this comes this comes back to this whole sort of introduction and you know uh, to to music and stuff and and how you know grabbing people's attention. My boy, who is seven, has the attention span uh, of about one second. <laughs> oh, no, it's crazy, right? You know, it's it's what's what's been really interesting the last few weeks, especially over Christmas. You know, Daddy, can we watch a film? I go, yeah, yeah. What about this this great film that I loved when I was a kid? Tried to watch I, um, randomly Teen Wolf, yeah. right? With Michael J. Fox. The thing takes fifteen minutes to do anything. Yeah, <laughs> like I didn't remember that. Yeah, I just remember watching the film and it being amazing. Yeah, but I'm sat there and I'm going, yeah, my boy's bored. Like, and it's oh, we're only a minute in, and like yeah. he's already going, Daddy, it's a no from me. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy, right? <laughs> Yeah, but it's it is um, it's not even necessarily a throwaway culture. It's a grab and go culture. Yeah, yeah, you can have anything you want at your fingertips pretty much instantaneously. And it days. worries me the the impact that's going to have on on the creative industries. In you know, when you see these, you know, the the, the Swedish songwriting teams that are, are carving these perfect pop gems, but they're they're almost being carved to suit that attention span that is TikTok. You know, nothing's longer than a minute. You know, everything is just so rapid. And, and you know, you're looking at, you said, like you say, you wanted to watch your films. So my, my, my kids like rarely watch films. They, they just watch YouTube and TikTok. And it's, yeah. in, you know, I'll, we, we're getting into like old bastard territory here. But yeah, uh, yeah. There, there's, there's so many positives that can come from having things like YouTube and Spotify and having all of that music at your disposal whenever I you feel want. like it's just new. That's, yeah. that's, that's for me, for me, like, I, I don't feel like it's old bastard territory. I grew up in a different world. Um, and actually I just feel like it's new and I kind of, I, you know, and as with everything that's new, some of it's shit. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse my friend. <laughs> no, my, absolutely. But, but, but that was the same 25 years ago. Yeah. You know, and for me, like one of the prime examples of that um, is like an uh, artist like Billie Eilish. Yeah. Now, when she first came on the scene, I was like, oh, God, what's this? Right. And I did. You know, I guess I was guilty of like doing the old, you know, the old like, oh, God, I'm not sure. You know, I don't really get it. This, that and the other. And then out of the blue, I'm driving along and um, I think it was Radio 2. They played uh, the 30th. And. I, I'm not kidding you. I haven't been nearly brought to tears from a piece of music, you know, probably uh, up to that point for about 10, 15 years. Yeah. And the, that girl managed to play a movie inside my head yeah. in three minutes. And I was like, wow, okay, now I get it. You know, so I, I think, you know, coming back to this whole, like, you know, old bastard territory, I think it's just new and that some people, you know, really like to hold on to the things that they know. Absolutely. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Did we actually <laughs> talk about what song you chose for your school? Uh, Sam Fender. Yeah. Sam I Fender, just... of course. Of course. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Well, let's move on to the, uh, the, the, the next track. Okay. And I'm going to ask you to tell me the first song you remember buying from a record shop, please. please. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, um, uh, embarrassingly, it was Grandma, We Love You. St. Winifred's <laughs> Choir, mate. We all bought it for our nans, mate. We all bought yeah, it for our nans. Yeah, bought it for, <laughs> bought it for Nan. And we, we, you know, and it was me and my sisters. We kind of, you know, clubbed our pocket money together. Um, yeah. And it was, it was lovely. And she kept it, you know, kept it till the day she was, you know, she wasn't with us anymore. I guess the first one I actually bought for myself was Wet, Wet, Wet. Um, yeah. end of part one, and um, I think I've always been and that's always the, that's the greatest hits, right? 
Um, yeah. 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 Um, and I guess I've always been a fan of just great vocalists, you know, really exceptional vocalists. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're perfect singers. You know, I'm, I'm you know, huge, a huge fan of Jeff Buckley, you know, and then, you, you know, Dave Matthews, like Bruce Springsteen, who, who arguably isn't the best singer in the world, you know, but huge fan of big, great, you know, vocals. And Marty Pella was one of those for me when I was a kid. Yeah. yeah. You know, and like songs like Good Night Girl and Angel Eyes and Sweet Little Mystery. And even though you yeah. couldn't understand some of the words he was saying because yeah. he's got it, it's just like, you know, I, I, you know, and that was the, that was the, in, the lovely thing about when I grew up, like Google wasn't a thing. You couldn't just Google the lyrics. Yeah. Have a tape. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you stop it and then rewind it and go, what was that? And yeah. give you blah, 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 blah. I'm, no, I'm like, no, that's definitely, it's not five, <laughs> five, you know, and you go back and forth until you'd sort of maybe get a little bit of it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Great time. Absolutely. And, 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 and it's weird because it, it felt around that point, like when, when Wet, Wet, Wet blew up in the sort of the, the tail end of the 80s and into the early 90s, there was just this sort of surge of, of, of Scottish pop music that come out that was sort of soulful, uh, you know, it, it, at its core, you know, bands like uh, Hue and Cry and, and and Deacon Blue and Texas, they were all all coming out, and and none of them I thought sounded super Scottish. And then the Proclaimers come out, and it was like that's yeah. super Scottish right there. <laughs> like that's as Scottish as it gets. <laughs> <laughs> they, they took it to ten. Great writers, though, like, you know, I think they've kind of suffered from the success of, like, 500 Miles. Oh, sunshine yeah. on leaf, Letter mate. You America. want a record that'll break you in art. Letter to America. Oh, my God. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. And seriously underrated, that band. I, yeah. I, I think, like, I they've, they've wrote so many. There's a fantastic documentary. Um, there's two, actually. And uh, Matt Lucas, uh, the, the comedian, done a, a, a documentary on the Proclaimers. He's a, he's a huge fan. Um and if you ever get to see, I'd urge anyone. Uh, the Proclaimers have come up quite a lot over the years on this podcast, and uh, and and for anybody that's never experienced uh, watching on YouTube, Hibs fans singing "Sunshine on Leaf," fuck me, it is absolutely goosebumps. It is amazing hearing like fifty thousand people singing "Sunshine on Leaf" is is a powerful thing. It's uh, yeah. Yeah, what a band! What a band! Yeah, I mean, without without sort of, you know, talking about their sort of infamous track Five Hundred Miles," but I don't know whether you ever caught the. I think it was the Commonwealth Games. It was it was put to um, ice dancing, um, mm. ice skating, um, and it was just heartbreaking. It was just yeah. the most beautiful thing, and it was like I was kind of going, "Yeah, I reckon that's how it was meant," you yeah. know. It was melancholy, but sort of, you know, it was just a celebration of like that. This is how I got far. I'd go for you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so tell me how, how things started in regards to you know you, you mentioned that that your mum uh, lagged a guitar for a fiver, and <laughs> yeah. and and then where did it go from? And, and and tell me a little bit about confidence. Because to as you said, you 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 shied away from the choir just through fear of getting shit off of your mates because no one done yeah. that sort of stuff, you know. Then, um, to then find yourself having a guitar and then I guess at some point you you got to get on stage with it, right? And yeah, I mean, I I remember being nervous. I don't remember ever being really nervous. The only time I've ever been really nervous, or the only times that I've ever been really nervous, is when I feel like I'm un underprepared. Yeah, I feel like I don't know what the hell I'm doing, and I've yeah. got to somehow wing it through this thing. I think for me, the the big thing that I've battled with over the years is I can't read music. I don't write music, and to be honest with you, I probably don't hundred percent know what key I'm writing in. Yeah, <laughs> or the time signature. Yeah, I know. I know if you know if it feels like a waltz it's either going to be three four or six eight you know yeah. for who's listening that's a musician they'll probably be laughing at that but that is the truth and yeah. i think that um very early on i had the good fortune of kind of 
you know, suddenly being in, you know, I, I was, you know, my first gig was at the Kashmir Club. Right. You know, um, like literally my first ever gig was at the Kashmir Club with Lucy Silvers um, and Paul McCartney dropped in that night. I mean, let, let's, I mean, and, that, that's yeah. some name drop, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't meet him, but it, yeah. like, it was back in the day that that particular um, gig, like it was right at the zenith of that particular gig. It was, um, it was kind of iconic in its day. And yeah, so that was like my first gig. Um, so I remember sort of suddenly being in a world where people really knew what they were doing. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, you know, I, I always felt very, there was very much, a, you know, there was a lot of imposter syndrome. But Vince, I, I, I honestly, like, the amount of, I mean, I, I, this is probably the 510th oh, episode I've done on this podcast, and I've spoken to hundreds and hundreds of, of you know, of, of some of the, 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 I guess, the most successful musicians out there. Um, and, uh, my camera's just disappeared for some reason. And uh, uh, and I don't think I've ever really had a conversation where anybody's ever told me that they, they like to write music. They write songs. And and I don't think most people can read music. Uh, and, yeah. and, and, and I, I think people, certainly working class people on the whole, stumble into it like you did when someone passes you a guitar there's a guitar around the house pick it up or there's a piano you know in the family and they start playing it and then they start this sounds good this sounds good and then you know you you know a few chords and then you can start to understand that that song's them chords I, I've generally found that most people have trod that path and not I went like... full time with 10 songs <laughs> exactly. and 10 covers and I I do I um, I remember I used to drive an hour and a half from Cheltenham to Marlow, and I used to do an open mic night on a Tuesday night, and it was never busy. And I used to do do my ten songs, and then I'd do them again. <laughs> you know, it was it, it was it was it was crazy, but like you know, I I loved it. I think the imposter syndrome for me has gone. Yeah. Um, and that's not because I'm like, oh, I'm now amazing yeah what it is i'm happy in my own skin yeah and i'm quite happy that like i'm a little bit odd i'm quite yeah. happy that you know i do things like you know crawl under the chair of a producer just to record the sound his shoes are making so we can put that into the album you know i'm i'm okay with all that yeah i wasn't before and i think that you know i think a lot of people i think the reason why it's so common is that I think it's quite difficult to get to a point where you're, you know, where, you, where you're okay with yourself. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a, you know, I, 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 that's kind of a a very difficult thing to do, you know, because it means you, you know, you're accepting, your, you know, everything, warts and all, you know. Yeah, if you're comfortable with your flaws, mate, then that's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not, and I never will be a saint. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I try not to be a dick. Yeah. <laughs> But I'm sure that there are plenty of times that I have been, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's it's you know just that. But I definitely, in terms of nerves, um, it, it was more about not feeling quite good enough. Yeah. Or or looking at you know, I've done I've done loads and loads of shows. You know, I'm I'm I've been on you know the same lineup as God knows ev you know loads of people. There's no point in listing, but you know household names you know for example and i you know I've, I've been there and i i've remembered so many times where i'm like i should i'm on the wrong i'm in the wrong room <laughs> like, yeah 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 um you know i remember doing it was a covers thing actually it was um out in saudi and i can't uh, i had to sign an nda so i can't really say who it was for but i remember being on this um cruise liner and all the talent was gathered in one room. And this woman came in and said, um, hi, guys, nice to finally meet you. As far as we're concerned, you are the best entertainment in the world right now. And I turned around to my to my my percussionist. I was like, we're in the wrong room. <laughs> <laughs> and part of me genuinely meant it. I was, yeah. You know, 20 people there, yeah. you know, and, you know, 
for that company we were you know we were you know we were considered to be the best entertainment out there yeah um, at that point in time which is like i still look at that and go really <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you know it's enjoy been a it time. absolutely man okay let's talk clubbing um tell me the song that soundtracked your years going to nightclubs oh. nightclubbing um so I'm, I was never like a, a like white gloves. No, with... this can be this can be the local right. rock club. This could be a dive bar. This could be wherever you spent your student years well, partying. Do you know what? There is literally one song. I I just it 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 did soundtrack my my uni, like my sort of you know my late teens, you know into my twenties, and it was Prodigy, Firestarter. Yeah, I mean, like t I I was listening to that today before we got on this call. And I'm like, banger. <laughs> like, yeah. Mate, it's, it's ridiculous. Absolute ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just like, okay, fine. Like, you know, talking about introductions. Yeah. You know, that intro, before you've heard anything, you're like, okay, I'm in. Yeah. You know, I, I, my coat's off. <laughs> I'm heading, I'm heading to the dance floor and it's going to get messy. You know, Absolutely. It, it was all, it's all over after, before five seconds have gone. It's in. ridiculous. It's ridiculous, yeah. that song. And, and, you know, us Essex boys, we're fiercely proud of, of the prodigy. You know, they're, 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 they're our own and we love them. And, and the thing is, you, you, know, you say that intro, that like whining, like synth noise, whatever it is, you're just thinking, where's this going? And then all of a sudden, Liam Howlett just takes beat making to a different point. And, you know, in 1990, was it six, seven? Yeah. You know, you start dropping them beats like he was doing on Firestarter, you know, smack my bitch up and breathe. It was like, fuck, what, where's he got this from? He's just like, he's kind of got like the hardest sort of hip hop beats and he's just got this punk guitar and, just this is exactly what I love about all different genres of music. Yeah. What you what you've done is kind of for me, straight away you've referenced all the different things that like in you know, in the recording of Scars, Ghosts and Glory, you know, my album, we were referencing like on like there's one track that you you'd never think it, but we spent like a day referencing NERD, yeah. um, Alabama Shakes, you know. And and then and then I was like, oh, you know that song, gonna take my horse to the yoke. I went that one, and he went, you know who that is, don't you? And I'm like, I'm like I don't know. And he goes, Trent Reznor, and I'm like, oh my god, you know. But that's these guys, you know, Prodigy, uh, Chemical Brothers, Daft Punk, you know, these they're innovators. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it doesn't matter absolutely. that it's dance music. And I think, you know, if you was to speak to Liam Halley, I, I dare say you would probably find that, that Trent Reznor and, and Nine Inch Nails were probably a big influence, you know, oh. in, in, in them sort of formative years. Because from going from making, you know, um, you know, Charlie and, you know, everybody in the place, these kind of happy hardcore anthems, yeah. to then all of a sudden, you know, that they're making No Good Start the Dance and Voodoo People. And all of a sudden, they're not so kind of, novelty rave and it was like oh hang on there's there's depth to this band and then all of a sudden you hear like poison and you're like whoa they've got like the drums on this are ridiculous and then they just return with fat of the land and that album like yeah. so starter it was just like oh my god and I, I see them at, at v97 or v98 it was a homecoming uh in chelmsford and they were, they said like we're playing we're in our own back garden and and i just remember because Keith was just the dancer, you know, and then all of a sudden you've just got one of the most exciting, iconic front men in the 90s. He's now got a mic in his hand and he's screaming Firestarter at you. And it's like, oh, my God, this is fucking unreal. It was like, you know, yeah. that was so many of that generation. That was probably their sex pistols. That was their punk. That was yeah. like, that's the shit that your mum and dad's going to go, what's this shit? Like, Literally, I was just going to say that, like, you know, my, my, my manager was the, like essentially the first manager of Sex Pistols. Yeah. Right. And the, the I, I was listening to it today. I was like, this is, this is punk. This, this was punk for a new generation. Yeah. yeah. It was that kind of like, I remember going crazy, but like defiantly crazy, 
you know it was it was kind of like don't tell me what to do you know any any it, it was yeah man great tune love it <laughs> love it okay i'm gonna take you home favorite okay. song from an artist from your home county please oh uh, yeah i had a i had a long think about this um what you got down there so there's there's a few right and like i come up with like this there's, there's there's a couple of like really died in the wall like m big festival acts that are never going to be like um huge commercial success but like they'll headline like big festivals because they're just mm. you know so mad dog mccray being being one yeah. of them yeah, Land of the Giants being another. I know both of those bands quite well. And they're just it's just that's just a party. Yeah. Like yeah. you go and see them live, it's a party. And then, you know, and then you've got people like Seth Lakeman, who who's a Plymouth boy. Um, I remember taking the mick out of Seth because I was doing a gig once and he was in the audience and I'd lost my plectrums, and he gave me this plectrum that was about as thick as a piece of paper. And I was like, what the fuck's this? <laughs> <laughs> and then my mate went, you know that Seth Lakeman, don't, don't you? You know, like, <laughs> and I was like, no, sorry. <laughs> um, and then Ben Howard came along. Oh, and, of course. You know, and I, I, I love it. Um, I loved his first album. He's, you know, he played all the venues that, you know, that I played or, or wanted to play you know, when I, when I was younger. And I think for me, the thing that sold it was Old Pine. Yeah. Um, on, you know, I, I can't remember the name of the album, but Old Pine, it's, you know, cold sand and sleeping bags. Yeah. You know, I grew up, I grew up in Plymouth. I, I was never more than a 15 minute walk from the beach. I remember, you know, spending my summers crazily sprinting off the edge of a cliff you know, trying to hit a six foot by six foot patch of water that would mean that I didn't break my legs. And, <laughs> you know, and I remember all that. I wasn't a surfer, but I I lived for the summer. Yeah. And there's nothing quite like it. You know, like old pine for me, it feels like home because it, it he it's a song. I I think it's a song about you know his summers in Devon and Cornwall. Yeah. Um, and it kind of feels like that for me, even the video. Um, one of the things I used to love doing, especially, you know, when I first learned to drive every now and again, I'd be able to borrow my mum's car, especially if it was raining and really windy. And I'd drive to the cliffs of Bubbersand and I would just literally get out my car and just stand and let the wind and everything hit me. I used to love that. And there's a scene in the video that, that he does that and i'm like yeah that's it that's I love that you know. love so that. yeah ben howard old fine and i can't play any of his songs because he's ridiculously talented <laughs> you can't read music so you're fucked aren't you <laughs> <laughs> yeah give me a month <laughs> oh vince it's your last track mate and uh and i'm going to ask you now to tell me a song that you think many people may not know but you would like them to hear um, right, so this is on the basis that um, I, I guess I'm, I'm sort of addressing a kind of a newer, gen you know, a younger generation than me. Um, I remember being uh, told to listen to this guy um, when I was about 20. Hated it. Hated it for like a month. But I'm, a, I'm very stubborn. And the person who told me to listen to it, I greatly respected him. So I was like, I'm going to keep listening to this until I get it. Until I get it or I don't, but I need to understand it. And I remember listening to the Grace album by Jeff Buckley over and over again. And there was a eureka moment about two, two weeks in, and it was this song. Um, I believe he was the last guy to be signed to Columbia Records with an open checkbook. Yeah. Um, and he got to make this before he passed. I think the last goodbye is like, they're, they're like all of the tracks are sublime. I think it's the closest thing to a masterpiece. You know, so, you know, it's, what is it? Seven songs on the Grace album. Um, 
but every single one is heartbreakingly good. Last Goodbye is, I, I feel like it's, it's a song that Kings of Leon would dream about doing. Yeah. You know, the killers would, you know, would, you know, give their right arms for. Um, it's just, it's too good, man. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a level with you. It's also about a minute long intro as well. Yeah, it's that lovely kind of winding guitar sort of slide at the beginning. It's, be it's beautiful. You know, one of the sounds on that is um is a, a saw, a long saw. Ah, really? Yeah. Yeah, they they um they used it as a like a bow, you know, the back of the yeah, sword, yeah, yeah. a bow. Yeah, as you know, I, I weirdly try and find weird details like that. I've got, I've got a level with you, Vince. Right, so everybody I know <clears throat> loves Jeff Buckley, right? Yeah, and I'm I was like you, right? So I was like, everything says to me I am going to love Jeff Buckley. Yeah. <clears throat> And and I bought Grace, like literally when it come out, like I'm old, and and I was like, I don't get it, I just don't get it. If you take, I guess if you take, you right. know, take lyrics out out of context, right? So, um, you gave me more to live for than all than you'll ever know. Like it, it, it's the simplicity of it is amazing. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, 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 You're... because. Because I, I, I literally went back. I love Last Goodbye, by the way. Like that, that, right. that straight away. That's the one that I could get away with playing in my club. Uh, yeah. And I really, really love uh, Everybody Here Loves You, which is non Grace. Like, right. which yeah. just sounds like that. It just sounds like an R&B record, a beautiful R&B record. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. And, and I literally, I've got the, the big deluxe box CD of Grace. Uh, and I went back about, I don't know, a month ago and put it on again and i'm like and, and he's, he covers a smith's record smith's my favorite band and i'm like why can't i get jeff buckley and i just i can't get it and i want to get it because everyone i know loves him i'm gonna ask you a question do you get rufus wainwright i don't mind rufus wainwright okay and, uh, so there's but... a thing about rufus wainwright's voice that is um that is uh, somewhat similar to jeff buckley's um people's brain uh, brains don't like uh uh, perfect notes. Well, that may explain because I think there's similarities with his voice and Matt Bellamy's from Muse. Right. And yeah. I love the first Muse record, but then all of a sudden he went so falsetto so often and it got quite complicated, the songs. And so I was when like... Have, when you don't have vibrato... Yeah. Right? Um, See, so when you don't have vibration in a, in a note... Yeah. Um, it... For for a lot of people, it makes you feel uncomfortable. Yeah, so it's a it's like a lit it's literally a, a um like a it's a physical reaction. Yeah. So a lot of people don't get on with people like Rufus Rainwright, yeah. um, Buckley for that reason. It took me a long time to get my head around Jeff Buckley. Yeah. I'm still it's, trying. I'm still trying. <laughs> there are notes that he hits. They just don't deviate. Yeah. And so and they they, they stay. Right where they are. Yeah. I think it's the purity of it of it that that I fell in love with. Um I, you know, I, Last Goodbye is probably more accessible than stuff like Lilac Wine or Grace, yeah. you know, but um yeah, I mean he was a special talent. Like oh mate, he, like his his version of Hallelujah, like I, I will say that I prefer John Cowles, but mm -hmm. he, he his version, like he's fucking beautiful. His voice is angelic. Yeah, but that album, like, it's not a beautiful thing about music. Like, you know what, right? Vince? You know, it like you, you're kind of going, I should get it, but I don't. That's okay. <laughs> That's it's so weird perfect. because I've never once in 500 episodes ever gone to a guest. I don't really like it, but <laughs> but right, with look Jeff that. Buckley, I have to say that because I want to like Jeff Buckley because I, everything about him, everything. The whole story. I love Tim Buckley. Like I love his dad's music, but for some reason, it it won't sit right with me, and I don't know why. But I'm the same with Led Zeppelin, and like all of my mates are massive musos, and they're like, "I mean, you don't fucking like Led Zeppelin." I'm like, I don't know what it is, and they're I like, have to, "After Sam, I agree with you. I, I like, I like the hooks." Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm not a great fan, but like you know, conversely, I I, I love the Who. So yeah. I guess that you know there is that kind of yeah, I love the Who. 
but um man like i feel like that's one of the things i love about music and i never used to be okay with this i never used to be okay with it because i felt like it it, it reflected on me yeah. because i was like oh my god right if you don't like this then you're not gonna like this that i've done yeah but that's all right yeah of course it is <laughs> <laughs> If, you know, it, it, I, it, you know, it just for me. I listen to stuff and I'm like, is it exceptional? Yeah. And if it's exceptional, I, you know, I, I want to understand it. Yeah. And that's that's the, so it's okay. I, I feel like it's okay not to like it. Yeah. Uh, it's still work in progress, Jeff Buckley, for me, man. I'll get there. <laughs> I'll get there. But uh, but yeah. I gotta come down to your club. And play <laughs> 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 wonderful well look we spoke about so many other people's music let's talk about your music tell me what's happening please um yeah i've i've made an album and do you know what uh it's been a long long time i've been doing this for like over 20 years now and i wouldn't change a note to i'm i'm absolutely i've never been prouder of anything and and it's not because you know across the board you know everyone's going i mean that kind of is the reaction which has been like that's wonderful yeah. you know it's nice when people turn around and go you did something nice you know yeah. you did something good and we get it yeah um i think i'm more grateful for the fact that there are a huge amount of people you know more people than i would have ever dreamed of you know now in this you know team there's like there's like 20 odd people you know behind this record now that have kind of just gone hey i'm in you know and by rights you know i was serving coffee during covid because i couldn't work yeah and before covid i'd um drifted ever so slowly all the while thinking i'm still a recording i'm still a recording artist I drifted into this world of corporate covers where I was getting paid a lot of money to play other people's songs. And then COVID came along, couldn't, couldn't catch a cold, you know, couldn't get any writing work, couldn't do anything. And so, you know, and this isn't, uh, you know, this isn't a sob story. This has happened to so many people in the arts, right? So it's not a woe is me. It's just kind of like I had to do something. Otherwise I was going to lose the house. So yeah. I started a coffee business. I hadn't given up, but I had, you know, I had reached a point in my life where I was like, you know what? No record label in the world is going to, you know, consider looking at me, you know, uh, a middle-aged guy with three kids, et cetera, et cetera, and go, hey, you're my next, you're my next signing. You're my next yeah. star, you know? Um, so I, I sort of come to terms with that. And then I served a coffee to a, um, a music and entertainment lawyer who happened to have just finished at Jay-Z's um, Live Nation contract. And he asked me how good I was. And I told him that I was good enough that I didn't need him to blow smoke up my ass. I didn't know who he was. Yeah, I didn't know he was a music lawyer. I was just um, shooting the breeze, I guess, with him because it was quiet. And he was my only customer and I was just chatting away and very, very long story short, he came back the next day, having made a phone call and said, I've got someone coming down to see you. And that's, you know, that resulted in my manager. And so, you know, fast forward, um, slowly, but surely I've managed to find people that, um, follow music and not trends and, of you know, I haven't had to twist their arm or or yeah. break it or bribe them. These are people, I, I feel like I have the most beautiful team of believers, like behind a record that I, I believe that, you know, it just needs half a shot. Yeah. And, you know, that was, that was my only, that was my criteria. I was like, you know, give me a tuxedo, give me one chip, and get me up onto the Wales table with one with one hand. Yeah. So, because that's what Scars Ghosts and Glory is about. And I just think the depth in it 
and it's weird talking about your own stuff and kind of and going yes it's amazing and you really need to listen to it yeah it, but that's terribly british isn't it to think like that and, yeah, and, and, and you know we, we we should be proud of what we do and we should be able to tell people that we think you're going to love this and i think the the thing for me is that i was always terrified of playing stuff to people until i made this record and uh, genuinely if i knew how to find him i'd i'd give quincy jones this i'd give rick rubin it um because i i genuinely believe it's that good and you know i i just i hope that i can continue sitting in this boat and enjoying the ride yeah. and you know and i i you know i hope the album gets a chance to be heard you know um by you know the amount of people i feel it should be because i think people will I think that people will get it, you know. I, I'm I've never been proud of of, of anything, and I, you know, my dreams have been made to come true because I've made the album that I always wanted to make. I've always wanted to be a recording artist, and I've been able to do that for the last year. So, what an amazing story to kind of like, you, stumbled across that, you know, working, you know, making coffee. That's that's oh, that's made my day. That is, mate. Oh, oh well, thank you. It's, uh, to be honest with you, it's um, yeah, it's 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 a it, it really is. It's kind of emotional, and it's in it's. I just you know I feel so thankful every day. Yeah, that's you know that's the bottom line. So, and so you know, I hope it you know I hope it continues. If people want to get in that boat and join you on this Please journey, do. like um, <laughs> where's the best place to to find out about all things? Vince Freeman. Yeah, I mean, listen, if you if you Google Vince Freeman, then I think that kind of covers the whole remit because yeah. that way, if you're a, of a younger generation and you want to find my TikTok account, you know, socials and all that kind of stuff, you'll find it from my website, which will come up. All my socials will come up. So I think probably the best thing to do is uh, just search Vince Freeman or just go to vincefreeman.com because that will take you wherever you need to go from, you know, from there, you know, if you're an, inst you know, if it's all for the gram for you, then you can, you know, you can find my Instagram, you know, quite easily just from two clicks. Fantastic. Well, if it's all right with you, um, when we put this out, we'll take you on everything. So if people aren't following you already, then they amazing. do so. Um, we also put together a little Spotify playlist, Vince, with all the songs that you've chosen. And obviously we'll put your music on that playlist as well. So people can go and uh, people can, that may not know or understand uh, Jeff Buckley yet, go over there and start working on it. Try and understand it and, uh, and send me some, send me some information. Let me know what I'm missing because uh, I'm determined to, uh, to be a Jeff Buckley fan. Can you can you um can you send me that playlist? I I I'd really like to hear that. Absolutely, mate. Absolutely, Vince. I've had such a good time chatting, man. It's been really really lovely. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank oh, you. Wicked. I'm gonna press stop. Don't go anywhere. Okay. <laughs>